Hello, 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 and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm one of your hosts, Katie Halper. And I'm the second host, Aaron Maté. Hello, everybody. And a reminder to go to usefulidiots.substack.com or usefulidiots.locals.com to support the show and get bonus content. Including extended interviews and Thursday Throwdown, which is your midweek dose of media madness where we react to very interesting, provocative, funny media clips. But first up, we have the four basic food groups. Democrats suck. Republicans suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? Let's kick it off with Democrats suck. And remember Joe Biden was going to resolve the issue of student debt? Well, he ran into some roadblocks, but guess what, everybody? He's got a new plan, and here it is. My fellow Americans, you know I'm a firm believer in education beyond high school, and that should be a ticket to the middle class, not a burden that weighs people down for decades to come trying to pay their debt. On day one of my administration, I promised to fix the problems of the existing student loan program that hurt borrowers for much too long. And I'm proud we're keeping that promise. We've already approved over $116 billion in debt cancellation for 3.4 million Americans, no matter how many lawsuits, challenges, or roadblocks Republican elected officials or special interests try to put in our way. Today, I'm proud to announce a new program called the SAVE Plan. It's the most affordable student loan plan ever. And here's how it works. To pay back that loan, you had to pay 10% of your discretionary income. That's all the income available to you after you pay for food, housing, and all your basic needs. Under my new plan, we're reducing that payment to just 5% of your disposable income. That's going to save the typical borrower around $1,000 a year. It's going to give borrowers a little bit more breathing room. And if your annual income is less than $30,000, your monthly payment will be zero until it gets above $30,000. As long as you pay what you owe under this plan, you'll no longer see your loan balance grow because of unpaid interest. Under the SAVE plan, monthly payments are based on your income. Some decent things in there, but remember, this is not what Biden promised. Biden promised to cancel at least $10,000 worth of student debt, up to $20,000, for anybody who makes less than $125,000 a year. But instead of just doing that, which many people argue he could have done through executive order. He forced people to apply. And then that gave right-wing groups plenty of time to file a lawsuit to block the the entire plan, which they successfully did via the Supreme Court. And this looks like just basically a effort to try to clean that up by forcing people still to pay, but just over a longer period of time. That's what ultimately I think this comes down to. And let's check out David Sirota's reaction. David Sirota of The Lever, who's done a lot of coverage of this. This is what he said. Uh Uh-oh. Get ready, guys. Biden promised an immediate cancellation of a minimum of $10,000 of student debt per person. He's now insisting that a new student debt repayment program is a promise kept. This is beyond Orwellian. It's just straight gaslighting. Well, one of, and one of the interesting things about this is that he makes it income-based, and that makes it a uh, needs-based forgiveness or not even forgiveness repayment plan and you know one of the things that makes programs more popular is when they're not need based so for instance social security right versus let's say welfare you talk have talk of welfare queens you never have talk of social security queens when things are for everyone they're much more robust and much more popular this is a way to make it not as popular and people will have probably you know resentments over uh, it being need based. And even people who benefit from this the most, he says that this will save you up to a thousand dollars per year. And if you're drowning under tens of thousands of dollars worth of student debt, I mean, it's better than nothing, I suppose, but it's not what he promised, which was right. some actual concrete relief of at least ten thousand right. dollars. Which again, you know, he's been urged to do not just by you know student debt groups, but even by senators saying you could use executive action to do this. So at least there's a case to be made that this could be done with a stroke of a pen. He won't even consider that. Right. Really, really kind of peak Biden, promise breaker, promise breaker in chief. Well, we have some really terrible Republican suck. Uh, let's go to democracy now to find out what they are doing, what Greg Abbott in particular, uh, Texas governor is doing. In Texas, 
A federal judge in Austin is hearing arguments today on a lawsuit filed by the Justice Department against Republican Governor Greg Abbott over Texas's installation of buoys in the Rio Grande River along the U.S.-Mexico border. The judge could issue an emergency injunction that would force Texas to remove the floating barrier within days. Texas authorities were reportedly trying to reposition the buoys ahead of today's hearing after Mexican officials said the barrier, aimed at blocking asylum seekers from reaching the United States, was installed on Mexico's side of the river. Between the buoys, there are circular saw blades. Dozens of asylum seekers, including children, have been severely injured. This is Democratic Congress member Joaquin Castro during a visit to the border city of Eagle Pass earlier this month. It's incredibly dangerous, incredibly inhumane, and it's the reason that I've said that it's barbaric, uh, because it is. You see that go all along there. People are getting stuck. There was a dead body that was stuck to this last week. Uh, reports of a child that died. If you go closer to this razor wire, there's people's clothing that has been stuck to the wire because they've gotten stuck in that wire. It's just disgusting. And I think this is a case where you really have to get a sense of the visuals to understand just how barbaric this is. I mean, you saw, if you're just listening, try to look because you can see these circular saws and just totally gruesome. It's inhumane. It's a way to kill or maim or injure people who are just fleeing basically economic or violent situations that of course the United States government has helped create. And uh, these people should be ashamed because you know, the people fleeing are doing things that so many people here would do if they were just wrong, but if they were just born in the wrong country. Yeah, especially a country that the US has terrorized with dirty wars or sanctions, which have so many Central American countries have faced. Yeah. And, and in the case of Mexico, like NAFTA and other economic agreements. Yeah. So that's my Republican suck. That is a strong Republican suck. All right. For isn't that weird, let's go to a steady source for weirds, and that is Florida and a very curious criminal case involving some Mountain Dew. Hey, and welcome back, everybody. So we see criminals cover up evidence in many fashions, cleaning supplies, chemicals, even burying things in the dirt. But one woman in Florida apparently chose Diet Mountain Dew. So on July 1st, someone flagged down officers in Daytona Beach to report a house fire. After firefighters put out the blaze, they found the body of 79-year-old Michael Cirasoli on the floor. Now, according to the affidavit, the victim had blunt force trauma to the back of his head and multiple stab wounds to his torso. Police discovered a bloody knife near his body and blood on the wall in his roommate's room. That roommate, 35-year-old Nicole Max, was arrested in the early hours of July 2nd at a Crystal Fast Food restaurant. She had blood on her leg and her shirt, which appeared torn. Police say when they approached her, she dropped a knife and hammer that she was carrying. Now here's where the Mountain Dew comes in. So when officers led Max to a squad car, she was informed that DNA would be collected from her. In response, Max asked officers for a drink, which happened to be a Diet Mountain Dew, and she proceeded to douse herself with it. Investigators claim that DNA from both parties was still found on the knife at the crime scene. Wow. A lesson of criminals everywhere. Don't do the do. Don't do the if do, you think exactly. That's gonna, yeah, if you think that's going to cover up for your crime, sorry, you're, you're out of luck. The do will not save you. The do won't save you. If you do the crime, you're going to do the time. Even if you do, do the do. If you're Mountain Dew, that's got to be awkward because every product loves free publicity. Right. But yet this, do you want this publicity? Do you want this kind of press? I mean, on, this, on the one hand, you, it kind of works to their benefit because they weren't an accessory to a cover-up. They actually right. prevented the cover-up. It didn't work. So right. I'd they're call this a win-win stoppers. for Mountain Dew. I think yeah. it's a win-win they're, they're, they're for, for Mountain Dew because they become crime yeah. stoppers. But also it's a great um, testament to their non-toxic chemicals. Because if it did mm-hmm. work in covering up DNA, that would be a real indictment of how strong the chemicals in Mountain Dew are. But now they can pretend they're this like natural safe product, which they are relatively speaking, I guess. Anyway, that must have been really funny to witness if you were the police. She's like, do you mind if I have a drink? And then just pour some Mountain Dew on herself. I wonder if it w- would have worked if she had like a real industrial sized Mountain Dew and a hose. And this episode of Useful Idiots is brought to you by Mountain Dew. 
stopping crime with a taste of lemon lime. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, I like okay. that. But I don't think wow. Mountain Dew. I don't think Mountain Dew is lemon lime. But anyway, I, I don't. What are they though? Honestly, what the hell are they? Mountain Dew flavor. Mountain, what flavor is that? Mountain, it's Dew. It's Mountain Dew. It's, it's Dew. the way that yeah. the Dew of Mountain tastes. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, for isn't that terrible? We have a terrible story involving some uh, creature near and dear to my heart. As people know, of course, I'm not talking about sharks because uh, I obviously I'm myself a crime stopper because I cut I expose and debunk shark aganda, which is ruining our society. The creature of which I speak is is the dog. I'm a big dog fan, as people know. So let's go to this heartbreaking story involving a dog and an airport. We were able to determine that the dog's owner had attempted to fly with the dog this morning and was denied boarding due to having an improper cargo container. Um, in turn, the dog was abandoned and its dog's owner continued to its resort destination as intended. Police say the owner had tried to board with that improper cargo container Donaldson was talking about. She was turned away. She also attempted to argue the dog was an emotional support animal. And when that did not work, police say she came back here to the short-term parking garage area before boarding her flight alone. She had left that French bulldog in the stroller with water and food in a Ziploc bag. So that is a terrible, I mean, it's a terrible on a couple of levels. One is, I think all, all dogs are emotional support dogs. Uh, they really are emotionally supportive. So I think everyone should get uh, automatically given that status. But I also think that that woman is just cruel. How could you leave a cute little French bulldog in a stroller, of all things? It really like hammers home just how childlike and vulnerable they are, that they're like a little baby in a stroller. I don't get how you could have a stroller for a puppy, for a dog, and then think it's appropriate to leave the dog, all for a resort vacation. She really wanted that vacay. It's awful. I hope the dog is adopted by someone nice and spoiled. That dog definitely deserves a good home after that ordeal. Yeah. yeah. It does I, sound like she tried. She, had she did try. Yeah, she tried. And I think, again, uh, this is part of a movement that we should really be spearheading here at Useful Idiots, which is the emotional support dog uh, movement, mm -hmm. whereby the dog is just by default, it's an emotional support dog, unless there's something really wrong with the dog. But that should be the default. You know, it's funny, my parents have my my parents have a total of three dogs and my dad, it's like my dad has two and my mom has one. Basically, we had a party at their place and the two dogs that my dad has, Oliver and Tony, they are very friendly, but they like to jump on people a lot and they also like to eat food. So my dad had them both on leashes at the party and someone asked me if that those were his emotional support dogs and i said no but mm -hmm. i really should have said yes of course what dog is not well that's a new campaign everybody emotional support dogs for all we can't have medicare for all but maybe we can at least get emotional support Doggy dogs care. for everybody yeah let's let's start there and those have been the four major food groups we're very excited to bring on to the show Sorab amari he's a founder and editor of compact magazine he was previously op-ed editor of the New York Post and a columnist and editor with the Wall Street Journal. And his latest book is Tyranny, Inc., How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Katie and Aaron. Thanks for having me. I just wanted to start out by asking you what made you decide to write this book? I was watching this uh, election in 2020, election night, uh, unfold. And although at that point, you know, by the time I went to bed, it, it was still unclear who had won the election. You know, one thing had become clear, which is that um, the Trump version of the GOP had consolidated the gains that it had made four years earlier with the white working class and even made inroads among working class people of color. And so, you know, I, at that point, I was a sort of one of the kind of conservative populists. I was the op editor, op -ed editor of the New York Post, which is the more kind of feisty populist uh, Murdoch paper. Um, so I thought I would write a kind of manifesto for a pro worker uh, conservatism, and that's what I pitched to to random to to my publisher, and they accepted it. But then came time to actually sort of thinking about what are the obstacles that stand in the way of working class flourishing, 
today. And I knew some of them. Um, and some of them I reported out in the process of doing the book in the early stages. And it seemed clear to me that writing a manifesto book of that kind would be sort of putting the, the cart before the horse. You know, it's, it's um, in many ways, the Republican Party, including in its kind of post-Trump pseudo-populist iteration that stands in many cases in the way of working class people attaining lives of security and dignity. And so that my time and my reader's time would be better served by the book that actually came to be Tyranny Inc., which is largely a repertorial book where I give a tour of our political economy from the point of view of ordinary people who faced what I call private coercion or private tyranny and paid the price for it. And so that's that's how the book kind of shifted so that the manuscript I turned into to my publisher was not, you know, exactly what I had proposed in the proposal stage, which actually that kind of often happens with books, as you know, but in this case, it was especially a stark shift. And what made you decide to focus on the way that private entities deprive people of liberty? Because obviously you're you are you're politically we'll get into this later on in the interview, your kind of political trajectory, but you're more conservative. And there's obviously been this huge focus, as you refer to in your book, you talk about Ronald Reagan and how much conservatives vilify big government as being Mm -hmm. kind of deprivers of liberty. So what made you want to focus on the private sector? Sure. So we had just gone through, um, you know, when I was op editor of the Post, um, we'd gone through the um, Hunter laptop story and and its censorship by big tech. So, um, and you know, we were at the eye of that storm in a sense. And I noticed like ordinary kind of normie conservatives were suddenly becoming alert to the possibility that not government but a kind of Silicon Valley mogul could unperson them if they say the wrong thing. So I thought that was an opening to address something deeper. What I mean by that is that conservatives are quite used to thinking of government as the only potential source of coercion in our lives, right? It's government that gives you parking tickets or hauls you to jail if you don't pay your taxes and so on. And it's actually, there's nothing wrong with being alert to potential state tyranny. Um, but there's this enormous blind spot, especially on the right, of the possibility for private coercion. And so the fact that a segment of the right was suddenly alert to what big tech could do to you seemed to me an opening to say, hey, let me show you other kinds of private coercion, which you might be, which are less visible, um, but in a way all the more insidious. So that, for example, the the forms of coercion I cover in the book, as you know, are um, the per- wage and scheduling precarity that workers on the lower rungs of the labor market face so that um, not only, you know, as the Federal Reserve has found, nearly half of Americans couldn't come up with $400 in cash to pay for an emergency, but in the way that employers increasingly structure their time, workers get no notice about their upcoming schedule. This is especially bad in the retail and service industries. The sorts of shifts that they get, either they get canceled last minute or they're what's called clopening shifts where the worker comes in for like the first hour or two, then has to go home and then has to return for the closing closing of the store. So all of that is ways to shift all the costs associated with periods of low demand onto workers. And it makes a chaos of people's lives because they can't do elder care. They can't do child care because you can't have any sense of predictability about your schedule. So that's a far less kind of visible form of coercion than what conservatives are now used to worrying about, like, uh, you know, big tech censorship. Um, I could go into other examples, but that was the idea. We had just gone through. So I thought this framing of, ah, you were just coerced by, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and bad enough. I mean, I I do think that what was done to the Post Hunter files reporting was a terrible example of censorship. But I want to bring my right wing audience to see, you know, these less visible, but all the more kind of systematic forms of private power and private coercion. Talk to us a bit about Trump and DeSantis and how they've developed this image, this persona as being populist. 
in the case of DeSantis for fighting big corporations like Disney. So he can claim he's taking on the big guy. But what is he actually fighting Disney over? Is it how they treat yeah. their workers or is it just these cultural issues that um, don't impact people's material well-being? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's worth recalling how Trump won the uh, GOP nomination in 2015 and 16. He did it not by, I mean, they were all culturally conservative and Trump, who's dubiously culturally conservative, sort of convinced everyone that he's also a cultural conservative. But what set him apart from like Ted Cruz and the others was the fact that he harked back to a kind of what I call the GOP, the, the GOP's Eisenhower-Nixon tradition, which unlike the Reagan tradition, the, the Eisenhower-Nixon tradition made peace with the New Deal and even those administrations expanded the logic of New Deal in other directions that, you know, the, the original New Dealers of FDR hadn't even thought about, uh, including like environmental protection and so on. Crazy, yeah. He did that by saying, I'm not going to cut your entitlements. He slammed, you know, Paul Ryan for being an entitlement, quote unquote, reformer, privatizer. He said, I potentially, I, he hinted at supporting a public option in healthcare. I don't know if you remember when his debate with Cruz, yeah, he said, uh, I'm not going to let people die on the streets. I know. Uh, I couldn't believe that. That was a shocking and, moment. And he got like, he got cheered for it rather than booed by the audience that was there. Um, and of course, he questioned the party's free trade orthodoxies. So the combination was that the result was that he you know, won decisive shares of working class people in, in marginal states like Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania and the, the highest marginal share of union households um, for a Republican nominee since Ronald Reagan. Unfortunately, what, what he did once he came into office was kind of not that different from any other Republican administration. So, um, you know, it, there was a, there was a lost opportunity there. Um, I will say that he set in motion the decoupling from China, which was, of course, a kind of corporate neoliberal consensus across both parties, and which now his successor has upheld as well and even accelerated. But other than that, you know, when he went to his Department of Labor, he filled it up with union busters. His biggest legislative accomplishment was a t corporate tax bonanza engineered by none other than Paul Ryan. And there you go. And, and then, of course, a kind of deregulatory frenzy with this moronic idea that, like, if you if you add one regulation, you have to remove two or like, what if the one of the two you just removed is something like, I don't know, air traffic control related and is necessary. So anyway, it, it, I think it was a lost opportunity. Um, I would argue that a figure like Ron DeSantis is like far worse in a way than Trump. Maybe your, many of your viewers won't accept where I'm going with this, but DeSantis is like pure culture war. He translates these populist grievances of, of the Republicans' increasingly downscaled base. He, tra he translates them purely into, you know, fighting Disney over the content of its programming rather than rethinking the amount of power we've handed over to corporations in general relative to workers and consumers and thinking about if we rebalance that power gap, um, maybe that would actually fix a lot of these issues, but it's it's none of that. You know, it's like everything goes back to wokeness and in a mo in a way that is. And I'm look, I'll be honest. Like there are elements of wokeness, what's called wokeness, that I find obnoxious to downright, you know, annoying to sinister. But not every problem in the country faces is like about wokeness. So like. Um, you know, he was asked on, on Fox News, what would you do with Ukraine on day one? And he was like, well, we got to got to get rid of all the trans and critical race theory in the military. And it's like, well, OK, you know, but what does that have to do with what you would do with, you You know, Biden has an answer to that question and Trump has an answer to that question. But to me, like a figure like DeSantis, the reason he does that is because he actually wants to reorient the Republican Party back to its old kind of pro-war, pro-business consensus, but he's learned to sort of put a anti-woke, pseudo-populist sheen on that. You know, Ron DeSantis is like an entitlement privatizer. And of course, Trump has hit him very hard about that. My mother lives in Massachusetts, which is part of the New Hampshire media market. So, you know, if you get a lot of primary ads, 
and a Trump aligned political action committee had this ad that I think was pretty devastating showing like this kind of lookalike of DeSantis, but more repulsive, like sticking his hand into a jar to like take out Nutella or chocolate or something. The idea was that he's going to raise your retirement benefits. Um, so yeah, I mean, the overall message here is that I think that for the most part, conservative populism is, is a mirage. Um, you know, I, I, you know, for all sorts of reasons, I was sympathetic to it early on because it would be nice to think that as the Democrats become the party of, you know, urban professional classes and so forth, the Republicans will realign and become a party of the working class. But I think if anyone who's honest watching the developments of the past decade or so would have to admit that ultimately that's largely been you know, elusive and, and a mirage. And it also can be used as a distraction, right? Like uh, culture war issues can distract working class people from the way that they're being economically screwed over. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, and, and, and on both sides, by the way. So let me give you the, the right wing example of this, which is one of my favorites. Um, you know, a few months ago, uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. And um, I actually think the Biden administration's response was pretty good that they they obviously contained the kind of financial crisis and ha handed over accounts and so forth to, to larger entities that are better regulated. But then they also did clawbacks so that taxpayers didn't feel like they bailed out, you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalists. So that was good. What was the response on the right? The response on the right was, you know, why, why did Silicon Valley Bank collapse? Because it was a woke bank. Yeah, that was so stupid. And it's, it is so stupid because you look at the picture of the like the board of directors, you know, they have their profiles on the website. It's all white guys. What are you talking about? What, what wokeness? It's uh, it's just regular old white guys. So, um, you know, and there's like a complex issue. America has had a banking problem in a way going back to the Jacksonian era. Most developed countries have a few highly regulated, almost public <laughs> utility type banks. The U.S. has, you know, this surfeit of small and regional banks, which precisely because they're small and regional, aren't subject to the same kind of um, safety controls that larger banks have been, certainly since the Great Recession. And so that's a complex issue. And a Republican should be able to give an, a complex answer to that. And to say it's about wokeness is, is idiotic. Sense. Now, I would say on the other side, I would argue that elements of the kind of center left kind of neoliberal management of workers use of language and sort of identitarian obsessions can also redound to the benefit of the asset rich in this country right. so for example i mean there's a infamous example which i give in the book i think first actually reported by jacobin of this rei you know it's a outdoor gear chain there's been an ongoing unionization drive at many of their stores and this um you know, chief diversity officer gets on this podcast and says, hello, I'm so-and-so, I'm, I'm your chief diversity officer, my pronouns are she, her, and I want to acknowledge that I come to you from the traditional lands of the Ohlone people. You know, so she does a pronoun check, she does a land acknowledgement, but the topic of the podcast is, you know, why you shouldn't join a labor union. So gross. Um, <laughs> and so, that, and more generally, I mean, I think like, some companies have been very explicit about this to, you know, to constantly frame organized labor as a thing of kind of old white men right. you know, and so on yeah. is a, a, is a way to divide the workforce. So if the more you have these sort of like celebrations of ever more boutique identities, the harder it is to build up um, solidarity across our cultural differences. So I think it's both ways, but right now they're like the anti-woke variety has become so grifty and fake and transparent that one can't help but notice it more right now there's <laughs> because a, of this campaign especially and, and there's also of course the famous hillary clinton will breaking up the banks and racism no in terms of like the yeah. the, the presentation of economic justice and um you know racial justice yes. as antithetical when obviously they're very interrelated absolutely there's a really progressive news show i'm not going to name it but back in the 2020 primary, when Elizabeth Warren dropped out, the oh the headline basically was that now the race is down to two older white men, Biden and Bernie, as if that's what is their defining characteristic. They're just old and white, not 
they're vastly separate uh, platforms and agendas that would have such a you know disparate impact, such such a different impact on working people and people of color, especially. Yeah, totally. Um, it's, it's it's really tiresome. I mean, I I I I don't know what you guys think about this, but. And, and, you know, in a way, I'm an outsider to this, but I do think some of this stuff is waning. I mean, I think people, especially on the on the center left, have uh, wised up to the fact that this stuff is like a obnoxious. Everyone it, it alienates people. It actually does kind of feed into more goonish type right wing um, anti woke politics. And so I, 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 yeah, I don't know. My my impression is and there's. You know, I've I've seen this ongoing conversation on the left of to what extent it's now on the wane. So you could quantify it by certain, you know, like certain key words used by the New York Times mm. like peaked in 2020, 2021 and have been on the downslope now. Um, but at any rate, the, the sooner we can get to kind of more substantive questions um, on both sides, I think the better for the country and for, for ordinary people. What do you think of the Oliver yeah. Anthony song, uh, Richmond, North of, of yeah. Richmond, and the whole controversy, the hoopla that's that surrounded it? Uh, there's a line in there that I, re I really don't like where he takes a shot at welfare recipients eating fudge. But I also can't ignore that he's written a song that does speak to the pain of average working people, which yeah. you cannot find so much these days on the broad liberal left. So what do you think of Yeah, of so I, I have the... I have the kind of almost the exact reaction that you described. I wrote about it. I have a column at the American Conservative. And what I noted was that I don't like that line, uh, that verse about fat people on welfare or whatever it is, is too on the nose. It's like, it's a little too what, what's said or joked about at your rubber chicken kind of Republican caucus meeting in, in whatever, wherever uh, Oliver Anthony's from. Um, that said, you know, much of the larger rage that it channels, I think, should be listened to. And I think it's a mistake for people on the on the left um, to find themselves on the same side as as National Review kind of poo pooing the song or dismissing it uh, or the pain that it, it expresses, which clearly resonates with a lot of people. National Review um, published an article which was sort of made made the made the author the character of the day on Twitter f for that day. Um, because he was like, because uh, there's another verse in there where the singer talks about, and I'm not a country fan and I don't remember lyrics that well, but it's something like working all day for bullshit wages or something like that. And National Review published a, a, a column saying, National Review is a much more kind of establishment type conservative magazine saying, oh, you know, my brother, if your wages are bad, labor market conditions are such that, you know, you should just move and right. go somewhere else. There's better wages elsewhere. And, you know, actually, you know, that's not true. Yes. I mean, there's certain sectors that are very hot or were in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. But on the whole, over the past two generations, as you know, real wages haven't grown for pe people in the bottom half of the labor market um, or just have barely ticked up, you know, once in the 90s and then post pandemic. But on the whole, the trend is relatively stagnant. And so, of course, National Review would say that kind of thing and rightly get sort of slammed for it. It's unfortunate to see some people on the left and center left be equally dismissive. I think the answer is like, yeah, wages are bad. And, you know, that's a system systemic problem. Here's how, you know, we would fix it, which I think the left has better solutions to this. Like, I don't know, a better, a higher minimum wage higher rates of union density so workers can collectively bargain for better wages. These are solutions that you still largely find on the center left and left. And so I think that attitude of so, sort of supercilious um, dismissal of the song is is not helpful, uh, is is uh, unfortunate. It's interesting, though, because that, that speaks to the distinction you make in your book between kind of like nominal freedom uh, mm -hmm. and actual freedom, like the power to, to, to do something. So like in theory, a worker has the, the, the power to find another job, but that's not really how it works because of the disparity and the asymmetry. Yep. So um, in the United States, uh, this idea emerged in the 19th century called liberty of contract. And um, before that, it was the idea of free labor is that Lincolnian idea 
which of course free labor was absolutely preferable to the alternative that the South had, which was like literally owning human beings. Um, but liberty of contract and free labor have their own flaws, and mainly the one you just said, which is um, the idea is, I mean, this is a classical definition, is that um, because both employer and employee have a mutual right to walk away from each other, they can enter into agreement and both each can leave the other, that their relationships are usually or even all the time optimal and shouldn't be interfered with by outside actors like government or labor unions. And I think there was a time maybe briefly in the late 18th century when that was true, when really you had a whole bunch of independent yeomen and um, mechanics and artisans, as they were called, who could really meet each other at an arm's length, transact and walk away. But as soon as you have the Industrial Revolution, and here I'm just literally restating Marx, but there were plenty of figures besides Marx in the 19th century who recognized this, including like plenty of Jacksonian figures, Andrew himself and, and uh, Roger Taney, Amos Kendall. These are all names that are forgotten to everyone on left and right, but they were populous in the 19th century. And they all realized that once you have this industrialization, that there grows this vast chasm of power between employers who are relatively fewer in number and a multitude of workers who have to compete with each other. And the fact that they're like that, the relationship is like that, is that one can really dictate the terms to the other unless workers can work together and, and mount collective power in response. And so, yeah, I mean, so we, uh, but I would, so what, what did away with liberty of contract in this country was um, the New Deal, where finally government recognized and made it its mission in a way to promote collective bargaining in most in most industries. Before that, you know, especially in the Lochner era, it's named after a Supreme Court, uh, uh, where the Supreme Court struck down a New York law uh, regulating or limiting the number of hours that bakers could work, six to 60 hours a week. And the court struck that down on the basis of liberty of contract. And then, of course, FDR famously uh, smashed the court in the mouth, more or less, uh, by threatening to pack it, and they suddenly changed their tune. Um, and we had this series of New Deal legislation, the Wagner Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act. But I argue in the book, and many others, I think a lot of progressives would argue as well, that we've returned almost to the 19th century model. So, for example, uh, in the use of commercial arbitration in the workplace, which is the one that enrages me the most, and it's a little bit technical, but basically... Commercial arbitration is an ancient practice where two merchants, typically of relatively equal bargaining power, they agree that if they're about to get into a deal, but if a dispute arises, they won't go to a traditional court. They'll resolve the dispute among themselves or, or submit it to a kind of neutral mediator to, who may not be a judge, may not be a court. It's supposed to be, it's faster, it's easier, it's not as bloody as litigation. And that's fine. Congress enacted a law called the Federal Arbitration Act in 1925, basically directing federal courts to uphold arbitral agreements. But it was always meant to be between merchants, merchants of relatively equal bargaining power. Herbert Hoover, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time and was a proponent of the Federal Arbitration Act, went to Congress, like wrote senators letters, testified that this would not apply to workers because everyone recognized that in an employment situation, the bargaining power is vastly disparate between the two sides. Nevertheless, beginning in the 1980s, the Supreme Court, led mainly by right of center Supreme Court justices, has expanded the scope of commercial arbitration to include the workplace, so that a guy named Stephen Morris, who was an, a low-level Ernst & Young employee, um, had a wage dispute with Ernst & Young. He was owed overtime about $2,000 worth of overtime for working more than 40 hours a week um, during high, you know, the high season, high tax season. But the only way he could have vindicated that right is if he could have teamed up with other workers similarly situated in a class action under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is a New Deal law that aims to empower workers to collectively act together. Nevertheless, our Supreme Court said, nope, the arbitration clause holds because Stephen Morris had freely contracted. And so even though it would have cost him $200,000 individually to recover 2,000, which is about 1% of the cost of the 
individual arbitration. Nevertheless, the court said, no, you have to go to this privatized court, which effectively means you can't vindicate your right on, rights under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Standards Act. Um, and this was done by, you know, Neil Gorsuch was the author, at the Supreme Court justice nominated by President Trump, the populist. Again, in that situation, especially one last detail, and I'll stop, I promise. But it wasn't like Stephen Morris even had the option when he was first hired to look at the arbitration clause. It was after months after he was hired, Ernst & Young sent a notice to all employees saying, if you show up to work the next day, hereforth you agree to arbitrate your disputes in a kind of company-run court. So at that point, according to like classically classical economic theory, like Stephen Morris had a chance to say, oh, OK, well, no, I disagree with that. I'm going to bargain a different result. And if not, I'll walk away. But everyone who's a normal person knows that that's not how it works. You have to, you know, your rent is due two weeks from now. You'd still, you still show up to work. Of course you do. Yet the, our, our Supreme Court said he had freely contracted. And so that shows you the problem with this model of liberty of contract. It assumes a kind of labor market that just hasn't existed since the 19th century. A lot of what you're saying sounds very leftist, um, and you got a favorable, your book got an overwhelmingly positive review at, at Jacobin uh, by from Matt McManus. And he writes, mm -hmm. Sorab Amari's critique of capitalist power is surprising and compelling. Uh, and But then he says, but as long as he remains committed to unjust hierarchies of power and power in gender and sexuality, he can't be a coalition partner with the left. Until the populist right recognizes the harm caused by anti-feminism, homophobia, racism, and more, I'll have to be thanks but no thanks on an enduring compact. Which is, I think, a little pun because you're the founder of Compact Magazine, compact right? Magazine. Yes. So what's your response to that? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. So that was a great discussion. Very interesting. And again, the book is called Tyranny, Inc., How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. And It's a lot leftier a lot than, to, than you think. Uh, yeah. I mean, you'd think that if a conservative was writing a book about this topic, that there'd be a lot of critiques of uh, what's called woke capitalism, right? right? And I don't like I don't like the term woke because as we've talked about, right. it's been appropriated from black culture. But that's the common term now. But if you actually read the book, there's not so much um, of that stuff. It's actually some solid critiques of neoliberalism, um, yeah. which both parties have adopted. And he certainly does not spare the Republican Party, even though he no. is a conservative. And it, it's obviously there are issues where we still disagree on cultural issues, on abortion. LGBTQ, but the fact that he, as a conservative, is voicing these arguments, it does speak to how what is now defined as left and right is changing. And to me, the ultimate mm -hmm. example of that is, as we discussed, the issue of war. We have some people on the right now who are more skeptical of war than some people on the left. And that's just weird. This is very yeah. weird. Well, thanks, guys. We will see you next week. And make sure you join us on Substack or Locals. That's usefulidiots.substack.com, usefulidiots.locals.com to see our Thursday Throwdown segment and also the full interview with our guests where we get more into that question of left-right coalitions. By the time you watch this, the RNC debate will already have happened. Hopefully you caught the Useful Idiots Katie Halper co-stream of that. But if you missed it, you can go back and find it on YouTube at Useful Idiots, uh, youtube.com slash Useful Idiots. Also join us on the next one, which will be September 27th. All right. Bye, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash useful idiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at useful idiot pod and use the hashtag useful idiots pod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the useful idiots Monday morning show where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 